Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Stan. This is my fellow magician for today, Peter. We are both red teamers at a company called Outflank, which is a company based in the Netherlands. And today you are here at the MS Office Magic Show. So a magic show, what are we going to do? We are going to show you three illusions that build on offensive tricks in MS Office. But, well, since we're hackers, we're actually going to brutally violate the code of honor for magicians, and we're actually going to explain all of our tricks after showing them. That's my intro. Let's dive straight into the details, because this is going to be a really fast-paced talk. Plenty of material in here. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to, come us to go, feel free to come to us after the talk or reach out to us on Twitter. I'm going to do the first illusion, and every magician should have a illusion in his playbook where he makes things disappear. So let's start there. Let's make a macro, let's make our evil code disappear. It's a basic trick, it's a basic trick. So, what we see here is demo1.doc, it's a uh, word file. I double click it, word opens. The MS Office Magic Show, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there's the famous yellow bar that says, hey, there's macro contents in here. Do you want to enable this? And of course I want to enable this. And as you can see, macro code runs, a calculator pops, a message box shows. That's it. Okay, let's close this. And now let's first of all look, where's the macro in the GUI? I don't see no macro in the GUI. It's not here. Um, but we all know not to rely on the GUI for this kind of things. So let's go to my analyst tools. I don't see no code. What's happening here? So I hope you're all puzzled right now. What the fuck happened? <laughs> <laughs> if yes, let's start. So this builds on a few offensive tricks. The first one is, how do you hide macros from the GUI? Um, I guess that most of you are familiar with what a OLE compound file is. Um, that's what you're seeing here. So if you look at the office file format for 97 to 2003, um, it's the OLE compound file format, which basically consists of storages and streams. It's like a, like a file system. So what you see here, is um, there's this Word document, demo one, which has a uh, storage called macros, which has a storage called VBA, and within that storage, uh, there are a few streams. And the interesting thing is that the stream instructing the GUI what to display is in the stream project, while the actual code that is going to run is in other streams, in this case in module one, and this document. So it's really silly, but hiding from the GUI is as much as opening the project stream, which is basically a text file, and just removing your, your modules from there. So the line that you see highlighted there, module is module one. If you just remove it, then thereby the GUI from Microsoft Word doesn't know that there's a module to open. Hiding from the GUI is as easy as that. But then you say, how do we hide our stuff from the analyst tools. Let's look at this output. Output from, in this case, um, OLE tools with OLE VBA. How does a tool like this work? It opens the potential malicious document. It sees that it is a OLE compound file. So it will see if there's a VBA storage in there. Yes, there is. And then from the relevant streams, like in our case, module one and this document, it starts carving out the relevant code and it will display that to the console of the analyst. Okay, so one of the questions that we have to ask is, what about input validation? Can we actually trust a malicious macro? Well, definitely not. So let's see what we can do here. What if we just insert backspace characters in comments <laughs> after our lines? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, 
I have tested this on a number of tools, including OLI tools, OLI dump, and all your favorite tools, and many of them, actually most of them, are vulnerable to this. I've reached out to the most important ones, including OLI tools, and there will be a fix there, but please help us spread this to other tools that, uh, that are being developed in this area. So this is fun. But in the illusion that I showed you, I actually used another trick. And the other trick that we use there is what is called P-code. And I guess that many of you have already seen the excellent talk by the guys from Walmart yesterday, um, where they looked into what happens with P-code, especially from a defensive, defensive perspective. Well, as we are red teamers, uh, we have looked into it mostly from an offensive perspective. And what you need to know is the following. It's a really quick summary about P-code. So if you have a only compound file, and there's a VBA storage in there, and within that storage there are the OLA streams that actually contain the macro code, then such an OLA stream, like the stream module one, consists of two parts. The first part is performance cache, which is undocumented. There's hardly anything to find about that. Um, in the... Um, in the official documentation, Microsoft actually says that this part must be ignored. Well, clearly it is not ignored in execution. And the other part is the compressed source code, which is just compression of the VBA source code that you can look at from the GUI. And this performance cache part of the OLA stream module contains what we call P code. There's much more in that, but part of the performance cache is P code. And what P-code is, it is a VBA version-specific pseudocode for the VBA stack machine. Well, that, that, that's a whole mouthful. But what you should know is that everything from Office 2010 onwards just uses the VBA 7 stack machine. And as Dr. Bonchev has done some really good research into this, and he shows that on his GitHub, what actually happens is the following. If you open a Word file or an Excel file containing macros, and both the version in specified in VBA projects, as well as the architecture, x86 versus x64, matches the version uh, of Word or Excel that's running on the host. Then this compressed source code, the actual code, is completely ignored, and VBA, and sorry, sorry, and the P code is ran instead of VBA. So, to explain it really easily, again, let's open our module stream. What you see on the bottom is the compressed source code and what you see on the top is uh, the P code. So what you can do, if you know the exact version of Word or Excel that your victim is, uh, is using, then you can just null out the compressed source code, leave the P code in there, and then actually the P code runs instead of the VBA source code. So if you then go to your analyst tool, again, the macro is, has completely disappeared. Um, we're still looking into fully weaponizing this, but for the time being, it's not that difficult. You develop your malicious document in two, um, uh, in two branches, x64 and x86. Then you open your malicious file in a compound file editor like FlexHex that I'm using. And then you go to bytes three and four of the uh, VBA project OLA stream. And you just make sure that the version number that's in there matches the version number of your victim. And we'll soon publish a small table with correct version numbers to do that. We're, we're weaponizing it, but it definitely can be used in, uh, in offensive operations. Okay, that concludes the explanation of the first trick. Um, I see some hands being raised. Let's do the questions afterwards, if that's okay with you. Thanks. If you thought this was fun, this was our basic trick. So I'm going to invite my fellow magician, Peter, to continue with the second trick. <laughs> So, a magic show should include cutting someone in half, right? That is the definition of a magic show. Well, for Stan, luckily, I'm not cutting him in half, we're cutting other things in half. Let's move directly towards a demo. Let's first close Stan's word instances. So, suppose we're sending an email to our victim a phishing email with a link saying, here's an interesting uh, Word document, please check it out. And that victim would end on a page like this. Well, in, in a real story, it wouldn't be like this page, but let's click a link, demo two. 
Well, what we see is two downloads being generated. So let's check our downloads uh, directory on our computer. And we see two files being downloaded from this, from this, uh, from this website. A readme.html and a docx file. As we all know, docx files, they can't be macros. So this, these are two really certainly non-malicious files. Let's open the readme file to just see if, if someone messed with it. No, this is a really an innocent readme file. It stays there, so it must be. <laughs> and then we open this file, which is also named innocent, so that one is probably innocent, and we downloaded it, so it will open in the protected mode. So in the protected mode, we click enable editing, and then suddenly, we get a security warning for macros. And if we enable that, we just pop the box. So we did a macro in a docx file. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a magic show. This is, this is not what we did. This was the illusion. I mean, really a, doc and a, a macro in a docx file? No, I can't do that. But I can make the impression, as you just saw, so how we did that? So the first step to think to, to, to learn is about office documents and templates. So Word documents can have a, a, a template, a, have, have reference to a template file, and typically this is undefined, and then your Word documents refers to normal dot. But you can make an explicit template, and you can use that, for example, in a company if you have like multiple brands and, and, and logos, etc. You use explicit templates and say, well, use this font for this document, use that one for that document. Templates can also include macros, and if you open a document, and the, the template will be loaded, and the macro events, the, the auto open events, will fire. And there is a, a full path just somewhere in the XML of a, of a, of a docx file uh, in, in, the, in the Word RELS settings XML. It's just a full path of this template file. So this is a basic. But there are some properties of these templates that we can that we can build upon. So, if Word can't locate the templates, it will start looking for the templates, just the last part of the file name in the current directory. And if the template is not found, there is no error. Word just then points to the, in the GUI, and, and the document itself is just rendered with a normal dot uh, file. This is kind of intended if you have your templates on a network share and you have a laptop user then you still can open the document, no errors, but the document is just rendered a bit differently. Interestingly, Word accepts a rename of a dot file, which is the old school template. Uh, you can just rename that to any uh, extension, uh, and Word just accepts that. No, I'm just, I'm really, yeah. No, I'm, sorry, I'm in a terrible jet lag, so I'm like, <laughs> Ah, that would be excellent. Arrange it when I'm talking. Yeah. Um, so we can rename it, uh, we, we can rename templates, dot templates, or not dot x or dot m templates, but the old school templates, we can rename them to any extension and it, it's being accepted. So what, what you just saw was a docx file with a template reference to just a path on another computer to a readme, which ends on readme.html, and then I, uh, yeah, and then on the computer, this, this readme.html file was loaded. But wait a minute, I opened the readme.html file, and it was an HTML file, and now I'm saying it's a template file. What's going on here? Well, this is a polyglot. So, uh, the template is this binary compound file Stan just mentioned. It's just a binary. We take the, we leave the header intact, and afterwards we just insert an HTML comment tag. And at the bottom of the of the document, we extend it with the close tag and some HTML with JavaScript, which says, "Well, the body of this document is just this innocent message." And Word accepts this. Uh, the binary compound file doesn't crash, so, uh, so cr crash Word. So this is just apparently interpreted correct. So now. We have these two documents, but we need to kind of deliver them. I mean, this only works as long as this template file and this docx file are in the same directory. So we need to bring another 
uh, a trick or, or, or step in our attack chain. And for that, we used a friend which, we, which, is, which is called HTML smuggling. HTML smuggling is a technique we often employ to bypass proxies. Um, the idea is the following. You, instead of serving a file on a file server, you serve, a, uh, you serve an HTML page which has some JavaScript code. And the JavaScript code uh, takes, has a big base64 string, which is the real file you're, you're serving. And then you, you, you within, the, within JavaScript, that generate binary blobs and make them available as a download link. And then with JavaScript, you click the link. This is something we often use to bypass sa proxies that do sandboxing because we don't have any files over the line. But as this is JavaScript, we can use this and, and run this uh, just run this twice and as such generate two downloads. So uh, Stan made, a, made an excellent write-up on smuggling. It's not something we invented, but it is really a cool technique just besides of, of the office stuff. So this completes the trick. So we have a website which generates two documents. The documents is one is a readme file, which is a poly, polyglot with uh, a doc uh, with, uh, with, with dot and some HTML content, and then the docx file that really loads that template. But there's much more in this in this line of field if you look into the templates. We often employ them for offensive purposes. So suppose you have a company that has uh, configured uh, uh, the trusted locations in Word for a network share. So companies do that, do this. So all the documents on that network share, share are automatically approved. The yellow bar is no longer needed. And there is maybe a valid reason for them. They want, don't want to train the users to click the yellow bar. So they put them on a, on a, tr on a trusted location. And we see this very often. And then for us, the trick is to find some, someone or somewhere where we can write. And if we can write there, we could just drop a docx file. But then we need to lure a user towards that. That's kind of tricky. So and the other thing is, these are kind of tricks where we don't know if the defenders are looking. So they may be doing periodic checks on these file shares. Is there something happening there? So one of the tricks we can do there is we copy just our evil dot file. But we now rename it, uh, we, we move it to this, to this network location, but we now rename it thumbs.db. Well, that's certainly not, not suspicious. No one will check the thumbs.db. Then in our own lab, we will prep a file, which is called invitation.x, and we will just include a full reference to a path. No, it should be doc. Sorry. And then we just sent one email to a domain admin saying, dear domain admin, there is this event. It's the Christmas event. Could you please participate? And this email will pass the proxy, the, the, will proxy, will, will pass spam filters because it is kind of a legit email. The document itself, it's, it doesn't have any payload in it because the payload is already on the network. So we can, yeah, this, this will most likely be executed. The only thing now holding us back is this protected mode, but we, yeah, with some social engineering, the, the guy will really click. I mean, we could just make the document look convincing. Um, and that brings us, so that could directly from just one variable file access, doing an outside email, uh, bring, uh, bring domain access credentials, uh, domain administrator access credentials in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our hands. And the nice thing is that for an investigation, this is really hard to track because you see emails on the outside via, and you see mails dropped on the inside and somehow they are connected. So if you would, if we apply this, like the blue teams, they really, they, they don't know where to look for because it's so hard to detect this, that this, these kind of tricks are going on. But we're not always all that lucky. I mean, we see these trusted network locations in about half, the, half of our engagements, but it's not always that kind of luck. So, then there's always this idea of, of backdooring legit documents, so just taking a file share and backdoor the documents on them. But if we would just backdoor documents, we, we kind of have problems. People copy, uh, just employees or, or users copy Word documents, copy Excel documents, and we don't know where they end up. So our virus ends up everywhere. So we want to have control. And if there's something suspicious and someone forwards it to the blue team or the SARC, 
we're not really happy with that, with that way of working of backdooring a legit file. So what we do is, is another trick. We copy an empty dot file or dot m to just a random file share. And on that random file share, we set the permissions. We uploaded the file, so any user in your domain can do that. He is the owner of the file, so he can set the permissions. And we just say, well, this file is open to all domain users. And in a typical setup on the, on the network, you have like two protections on how shares are secured and the, the share level and the, the file level. On the share level, typical setup is have all the domain users accepted. So everybody can now access this file. Then we start looking for interesting files. Yeah, but there's an interest, there's a, there's a nice script, find interesting files. We'll just search for files that have been recently accessed um, in the last seven days and where we have write access. So let's just start looking for all the files that our user has that is somewhere in use the last seven days. And what we do is we just reference all the uh, all these documents to this empty dot uh, this empty dot file we just created. So nothing is changing. We're just making references. And how we do this? Well, that's uh, the link there. Uh, yesterday I, I put out put it on GitHub. This is a script we wrote for doing this. And the script is really simple. Unzip this doc uh, this doc file format, parse parse the XMLs, update this template location, and zip it back again. So there we are. We have a lot of files now referencing our template, and then we come with a weaponization. So we place our backdoor in this file, and then all over the place, people will get macro warnings. We get a lot of beacons or whatever we use flying into our network. And if we say, well, we're now running this for half an hour, this is sufficient, we just remove this payload from this, this .m file, and it's gone. If people for if, if employees would forward documents to the SOC, there's nothing in these documents because it's in the template. You can even go steps further. We can now so we can control time by by doing this uh, inserting the, the payload or not. We can also control the victims. I expressly said that all domain users are allowed to read this file. What if I say, well, all domain users except for the blue team, or maybe I'm targeting this department. Let's set the permissions that only this department or this guy gets this, uh, this marker warning and all other people who open this file will just see this normal, this normal reference. So that's kind of a nifty trick. There's a lot more work to be done on these templates. We have a lot of IDs. Uh, this research is certainly not completed. I mean, including doing this by combining it with a responder and just having uh, having uh, uh, hashes being relayed is also a, a version or a variant we're, we're thinking about. So there's a lot of uh, future work in this area, but we think this uh, this already brings some cool tricks into our playbook. Now let's go. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. Let's go to our third and final trick. Smooth as silk. <clears throat> and it's the oldest trick in the magic book. Because with this trick, we're only going to use technology, techniques that are at least 25 years old. So who of you are younger than 25? Okay. So the stuff that we're going to use here is older than you guys are. And it actually still works on the most recent Office versions. So let's see what I'm talking about. We're going back to our demo environment. Let's clean up the mess that Peter left, just as I did for him. <laughs> okay. Cool. Oh, browser. Click here for demo tree to download a file. Do you want to download demo3.slk? Wait, what? 99 bytes? Just 99 bytes? That's interesting. Let's download this file. OK. Let's go to disk where it's been downloaded. And I now indeed see demo3.slk. If I zoom in on here, I see indeed it really is 99 bytes. Let's open the file. D 
This is really interesting. I'm not sure if you're noticing, but if you look at the warning that's being displayed here, it's a macro warning immediately. Although I've downloaded this file, which means that it should have opened in protected view, right? So for one reason or another, I'm not hitting protected view here, but I'm immediately being sent straight towards the macro warning. But I don't see any macro whatever, but I'll, 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 click, I'll click. I don't see anything, but I'll click enable content. And there's my calculator, 99 bytes. Let's see where the macro is. Go to the macro editor. Nothing there. Wow, what kind of file is this? It's just an ASCII text file. That's trick three. So what happened here? I see some puzzled faces, which is good. Um, let's, let's first of all start with what a silk file is. <laughs> silk stands for a symbolic link. Um, it's a file format that has been developed by Microsoft in the 1980s. Um, I believe it's in somewhere around 1984, which means it's exactly as old as I am. And it was introduced for exchanging spreadsheet data with other programs than Microsoft Excel programs. It's a completely text-based ASCII file format. There's nothing binary in there, it's all ASCII. And the SLK extension is associated with Excel by default up to and including the latest Office 2016 versions. Um, Matt Nelson from SpectraOps already showed that this can be, um, can be weaponized via DDE. So apparently you can use uh, DDE in here and do execution with that, but we go a step further. But what is really interesting to note is that by design, because it is a text-based file format, silk files will never be opened in the protected view sandbox. So all text-based files, including CSV, et cetera, will never be opened in the protected view sandbox by Microsoft Office application. So that also applies to SLK files. Okay, this is a little bit of background on SLK files, but what can you put in there? Um, in the beginning, I had no clue. So I started looking at some simple examples that I could find on the web. This is a basic Silk file. Um, Silk works with lines, and each line is called a record, and it starts with a record type, and then a semicolon, and then a number of fields that you can use after that. So let's look at this example. <laughs> the first line says ID P. ID is obligatory for every Silk file to start with. P is uh, the field where you can specify the program that is used for this silk file, but you can leave it empty. And then we see a number of C, um, uh, C records. And let's look at the first C record, for example. It says C, which means cell. The cell is located at Y1, X1, which means row one, column one. <laughs> and then there's the value, which is defined by K. This is row one. So we also specify row two and uh, row three in, uh, in column one. And then we specify numeric values for row one, two, and three in column two. And then at the last, there's the E record, which says end of the silk file. This is a basic silk file. That's pretty easy. But the question is, what other stuff can I do with a silk file? This took me quite some time to figure out. Um, I got my hands on an excellent book, which is called The File Format Handbook by Gunther Born. It's from 1995. And there's, there's, there's file formats in there that have died long ago and that I've never heard of. It could only, I could only buy it secondhand. It was, but, but it's a great book. It's really a great book. So if you can get it, get a copy of it. <laughs> and there's also a, a really ancient specification it's a file called silksum.doc, which has been, uh, been made by Microsoft, and it's floating around the Internet. Um, there's no really good URLs I can point to, but if you just Google for it, you will definitely find it. It's not a doc file. It's actually an ASCII text file that they named .doc, but that's because this stuff is so old. Um, <laughs> if you look into silksum.doc, into the specification, there is this following line, which, which completely caught me. Macro executable sheet. 
Note that this should appear before the first occurrence of G or F field in an NN record, otherwise not enabled in Excel, also before this first C record which uses a macro only function. I had no clue what this was saying, but I had just one question. Wait, what can I do macros in a plain text file, in a plain text silk file? And apparently, yes, you can. So, pop your calculator in less than 100 bytes, you see it right here. <laughs> Um, it looks really trivial, but it took me hours and hours to find this out, actually. It's just a shame if you look at how trivial the code is. So what does it do? First line is every silk file, ID with P leaving empty. Then there's a O record with E being specified. And this means, according to the specification, that I'm introducing a macro sheet into my file. Then there's a, an N record, which specifies that a function named auto open is to be introduced at row one, column one. And whatever comes after that, that's just disregarded, so we don't care about that. <laughs> then I introduce a cell at row one, column one, which says exec calc.exe. Then at row two, I say halt, and then end of the, uh, of the silk file. And if you open this and execute it, calculator pops after you enable macros. Um, what I did in my trick is not to introduce the macro code at row one, column one, but the macro code, if I go there, let's, it's probably still open, should be somewhere here. So that's why you didn't see it. Okay. <laughs> so, for those of you who are familiar with VBA, and that's probably almost all of you, this is not VBA. It's something completely different. VBA didn't even exist by the time the silk files were introduced. Welcome to 92. Welcome to the world of what we call XLM macros. Wait, what? XLM macros? Um, if you have no clue, what are XLM macros? <laughs> <laughs> XLM macros are way older than Clippy. Let's start with that. So if you think Clippy is old, this stuff is way older. Um, XLM macros are actually Excel 4.0 macros. And Excel 4.0 was introduced in 1992 for Windows 3.0 and 3.1. VBA was introduced later, in 1993. So by this time, VBA didn't even exist for Word and Excel. <laughs> but XLM macros are still supported in Office 2016. It gets even better. They are also supported on Mac, including in SLK files. So yes, you can do a 99 bytes uh, process creation SLK file on Mac as well. Um, <clears throat> so you can embed Excel 4.0 macros in different file formats. There's one file format which is really, um, um, which was really being developed to contain this, which is XLM files, and they are actually being blocked by recent Microsoft Office version. But Excel 4.0 macros can still be embedded in sheets within modern file formats like XLSM, XLS, or ancient form file formats like SLK, and that still works. So you're now probably wondering, how do I create such an Excel 4.0 macro in, for example, XLS? Let's go back to Excel. File, new, this is Excel. I'm creating an Excel file now, not an SLK file. Right click on sheet one, insert, and then there's this option here, MS Excel 4.0 macro. Who of you have ever seen that? A few hands, you must be old. <laughs> Just kidding, <laughs> Just kidding. So you say, okay, and now I have another sheet called macro one right here in the bottom. Sorry, mark, disappear, macro one, it says. Cool. Um, what I can do here is say, exec, calc.exe, halt. This is just how XLM macros work. They always have to end with halt or return. Then I can say, let's try this out. Run. I'm going to run the macro at row one, column one. And there's calculator. And if I want this to auto open, I can just name my first cell auto underscore open. 
And if I save this, I have a macro in an Excel file, which is not PBA. And if I want to hide this, I can just say, hide the sheet. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it will still run, of course. Um, so that was a basic macro. But now you want to really weaponize this, at least we do. And this was a pain in the ass, but after hours and hours of figuring out how I could map internal window stuff to data types that are supported in Excel 4.0, I came up with this macro. <laughs> this is shellcode injection in XLM. Um, I don't have time to explain what's going on in this code, so if you want to know, look at the block that's down there, but yes, this is the Windows 32 API being called uh, using XLM macros. <coughs> Immediately after I put this out on Twitter, there was a guy uh, called Philip Zuckerman from Cyber Reason who pointed out that XLM macros are also um, exposed via COM and via DCOM. So this is also an interesting lateral movement option where you can just pass the XLM macro as a string to a DCOM exposed method which means that you can, lateral move, you can do lateral movement via XLM macros, which means that you should be able to do shellcode injection via DCOM and XLM macros. I haven't fully weaponized that, but I'm pretty sure that we will get there. So this is fun. Have a good look into it. So there's some Kung Fu happening there. <laughs> and now let's get to an interesting part. How are XLM macros being stored in various file formats? Let's have a look at the compound file format. And on the left, you see a screenshot of how a regular VBA macro is stored. We've already seen this in demo one. There's a storage called VBA, which has all these streams where the actual code is. And this is a, a um, standard file structure which is being used by every AV scanner that's out there just to extract the VBA modules and to see if there's anything malicious in there. <laughs> With XLM macros, the stuff is completely different. XLM macros are just a special type of sheet that's in a file, and you see that in the screenshot on the right. There is no separate storage for macros, for XLM macros. It's all in the regular workbook OLA stream right there. Um, and this might be one of the reasons why apparently the whole antivirus industry seems to have completely forgotten about this prehistoric technology, because I uploaded the shellcode injection sheet to Virus Total, and <laughs> yeah, try this with an unobfuscated shellcode injector in VBA, and you will definitely not get scores like this. So this is really a call out to the AV industry: do something with this stuff, because it can be weaponized. That's what we have shown. And right now, detection rates are way too low. Um, let's go one step further. That's AV. But what about MZ? Microsoft recently announced that the anti-malware scan interface now also integrates with the VBA agent on the most recent Office 365 client applications, which means that you can use a MZ provider to look into what VBA code is actually being execute it without all the obfuscation that might be in there. Actually, how it works is the MZ interface catches all, um, uh, all call methods that are being called, and it catches all Windows 32 API calls that are being called, and it logs them via MZ to the MZ provider. <laughs> but that's VBA. And the MZ provider hasn't opened up to XML. So yes, in this case, we can use 26-year-old technology to actually circumvent, I'm not saying bypass, I'm saying circumvent the MZI provider that has been recently introduced. So actually, this whole XLM, XL 4.0 macro stuff, with the current defensive layout that we see there, is really interesting for red teamers, but unfortunately also for the bad guys that are out there. So we as an industry, we really need to do something about this. This concludes my third trick. Um, there's 
plenty of work to do in this area. I've only scratched upon the surface and there's probably so many interesting stuff in these directions that we can gather. So we as a community, as an offensive community as well, let's see what we can get out of this. Then back to Peter for the final thoughts. So this was kind of Stan's Pandora box uh, with his ex XLMs. But there's much more to come um, as soon as Microsoft allows us. So the tricks we demoed, we believe they're fully in line with specs. So this is kind of the desired functionality apparently. Um, we got some other tricks as well. So we got a fishy monkey that steals your files. And we have a don't take the bait, credential stealing word documents. And both these are 100% macro free and not these trickeries we just used, but really macro free. But we can't really talk about that because we're in the Microsoft responsible disclosure process. Updates will be released and then we will uh, release what was behind that and what we were actually doing there. So there's a lot of more interesting stuff coming up the upcoming weeks and months from our end. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember that there was a question from the guy with the white shirt in the back. So the question is, with the P code stuff that we have seen in the first trick, what kind of version was I talking about? And Yes, it seems to be about the major version, like 2016 or 2013 or 2010, um, but depending on the architecture, x64 or x86. Thanks. Thank you. That's a good question. What happens if you turn off macros in your environment? Um, if I recall correctly, I've, I've done all kinds of testing. Um, this does adhere to the macro rules. So if you completely turn off macros, then XLM macros won't run. Um, but there's something that we didn't mention, which you should keep in mind. Please be aware, and that relates to trick two of Peter, that things like trusted locations, always are prioritized above your macro settings. So you can have the macro settings at completely disabled, but if you have a trusted location, then still macros will run from that location despite your macro settings. That's the, something that you should keep in mind. All right, thank you all.